Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. How's everyone doing today? Well, I'm doing good. Great. Okay, so um, it's so nice to see so many different faces. You guys, um, I don't know if you guys know me and my sister. We, um, my name is Aisha, and this is. Oh, okay. <laughs> we is. do this in our videos, so it's always a this is Aisha, this is Kashmir Maryam, but you know. <laughs> but um, okay, so um, how many of us here thinks they know what the talk is about? Oh, you got to tell us what is it about, sister? It's gonna be about all the different types of love. Okay. Is interesting. Interesting. Maybe I'm not gonna <laughs> tell you. Okay. <laughs> but um, okay, so we'll begin soon, inshallah. In fact, we'll begin right now. And um, before we begin, I would like to do the opening du'a, which is Bismillahi wa salatu wa salam ala Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wa sallam. And Rabbi shahri sadri wa yassirli amri wa hlal uqdatan min lisani yafqahu qawli. So normally, when I give a talk, I would stand up and do it. Can I stand up or? Would that be? No, okay, I'll sit down. No, you can. It's up to you. It's, um, okay, I'll, I'll sit down for today. Um, but this talk is basically called Happily Ever After. And the thing about this talk is going to be, it's going to be very practical. My sister's going to be more, um, she's, you'll find out soon, God willing. And I want to begin with a story. And you guys probably all know this story, the greatest love story in history. Who thinks they know what I'm talking about? Cinderella. Who? Cinderella. Cinderella? <laughs> Real love story. Real love story. Okay. Real love story, yes. Would it be the Prophet and Khadija? Oh! Or the Creator and yes. like you and your, the Creator? That's deep. <laughs> but that's not the answer I'm looking for. <laughs> Anyone else? Romeo and Juliet. Almost, almost. Really? Very close. I'll, 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 I'll yeah. give you a few that's clues. That's what people consider real. I'm not so, so basically, um, this story is about a man. And he was alone, and he didn't have any companions, he didn't have anyone. One day he falls asleep, he wakes up, and he sees a beautiful woman just standing above him. And he's like, where did she come from? Who is she? She was literally his soulmate, made from his very rib. You know who I'm talking about, right? Adam alayhi salam and Hawa Eve. Alayhi salam means peace beyond them both. And um, basically today, uh, t together, they lived a heavenly life. Um, literally, they, we all know that they used to reside in heaven, right? And then unfortunately the fall came. The fall meaning that they fell from, from heaven and they were tricked and they started to live life on earth. And we all know what story this is and some say that they were separated. In fact, the scholars say that they were separated when they both fell from heaven. And what happened was he went looking for her. Because he, 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 and some say he went looking all around the world and then he found her and every single person you see today, every single person you see outside, every single person who's ever existed are proof of that love story. And it's a story of our father Adam and our mother Eve, peace be on them both. And a question that I have for all of you guys, and you guys have to be honest with me, okay? Don't be shy, it's just a simple question. How many of you guys want to get married? Wow, okay. <laughs> One, two, three, four, Everyone. all of you, right? Thank you for being honest, because some people are like, oh my gosh, that thing. But it's like, <laughs> you know, it happens, we need to get married. And um, the thing about being married is, um, it's, it's a very good thing, but the question I also want to ask you now is how many of you guys want to get divorced? No. <laughs> That's the answer I'm looking for. Nobody, right? Now, why am I saying this? The reason why is because I'm going to throw a few statistics at you guys and then you'll understand a little bit. Um, a major problem which is poisoning our society today is the problem of divorce. And a lot of people, they won't speak about it. They always talk about falling in love, but they never talk about falling out of love and what happens and when people, they separate and then they get divorced and they move away from each other. So I wanted to kind of do it at a different angle today. And I wanted to take preventive steps from that happening. And how do you prevent something from happening in the first place? Who thinks they know? You go right to the beginning and you do it properly in the first place, right? So um, I'll give you a few statistics. Um, and one of the statistics is at Rutgers University National Marriage Project, the American divorce rate today is twice that of 1960. So there is a huge high in divorce rates happening all around the country in America. And in fact, um, a study was done on Muslims. And this study was done um, 
In fact, it was a New York-based sociologist. His name was Ilyas Bayunis. And he did a study for Islamic Horizons magazine, and he actually found that according to his research, the continental Muslim divorce rate stood at 31.14%. And this was a far cry from the Muslims' world's two highest divorce rates, basically um, saying that the divorce rate in America is way higher than anywhere else for Muslims in any other Muslim country. Doesn't that blow your mind a little bit? And the reason why, I'm going to ask you in a second, is why do you think that divorce is becoming such a great problem today? Feel free to volunteer and answer. Yes? No one wants to compromise. Nobody wants to compromise. That's a very good answer. Anyone else? Yes? Yes, maybe it starts off as hard on some situations. Yes, that's, that's a very excellent question. I wonder, yes. here in the United States, it might depend the reason why they get married to begin with. Mm. Exactly. Like they, sometimes we have to look at the beginning mm -hmm. of why that happened. Exactly. Very, very good. She's looking at the root of the problem, and each one of us are very good as well. Assalamualaikum, sister. Yes. I also wonder um, if that could possibly be because of different cultural norms, I guess, because mm -hmm. I know for a fact that in, uh, specifically, I'm going to speak on just behalf of Middle Eastern countries, um, there is a great stigma towards mm -hmm. women who get divorced, and mm -hmm. in the United States, it's, it tends to be more, I hate using this word, but more liberal when it comes to, you know, yes. divorce or marriage, so mm -hmm. I wonder if that could be a factor as well. Yes, definitely. Um, yes, it definitely is a factor. But the answer I'm going to give you is probably something you're going to be like, oh. <laughs> but the answer is very simple. Um, I want to give you a hadith. And this hadith was reported by Jabir, um, radiallahu an, And he said, the messenger of Allah, who we believe is Muhammad, peace be upon him, the final prophet of Allah. And he narrated something in a narration. And he said that the prophet, peace be upon him, said, Verily Iblis, who we call Satan, our name for Shaitan, Verily Iblis's throne is above water, okay? And then he sends out his troops. And the nearest to him are the greatest that cause tribulation and problems for people. And one of them will say to him, or do say to him, I have done this and this. And then the devil will look at him and he'll say, you did nothing. And then another one's going to come to him and he's going to say, I did this until the wife and husband separated. And then he's going to say, now this is the one who is close to me. So why does Shaitan, the devil, make such an effort to break a family up? I mean, the other people, what they said was this, uh, sorry, the, the, other, the other part of his party, they were saying that they were doing things like maybe I made this person kill this person. I made this person do this. And those are major sins. But when the one came to him and said to him, I made this couple divorce, why was this such a such a huge thing to the devil himself. Why do you think it's such a huge, huge, huge thing, divorce? Not from the cultural perspective, but from the religious perspective. Yes? I don't know if I'm right, but um, I believe you you have to get married to like complete the other half of your deed. So um, when you love each other, for the you love because of the sake of Allah. Yes. So I feel like that upon itself to break love mm -hmm. is like the main goal of Satan or Shaitan to exactly. like make you um, misguided from not like following Allah. Yes. So, you know, exactly. I don't know if I worded that right. <laughs> no, you worded that beautifully. That is very true. And um, now that is a very insightful answer. The thing is, um, the answer, the answer which <coughs> I'm going to give you is that is also the answer. The reason why is because what is society made out of? What is society made out of? You and I, right? It's made out of people. Who do each one of us come from? Our parents. Parents, your mother and your father. Now, if you notice, most of the time when there's a broken family, not all broken families, it makes it harder for the child to live a life as easy as it could have been if the mum and dad were getting along with each other. You know a person who's come from a, a family where the father was abusing the mother, or the mother had to leave the father, or the, the mother, um, you know, the problems within the, within the marriage. And if they break up and divorce, it's harder for the child to have the same chances and the same opportunities emotionally, financially, 
and in other aspects too, to live a normal life, as you would say, right? Mm -hmm. So that's why when you go to the root of the problem, which is the family, you know it's gonna affect a whole generation of people. And I'm not saying that that's always the case, but it makes it more likely. And you guys are nodding your head because you know that that's, it, you've, you've probably seen it. You've probably seen it in real life, you know? And um, the thing is, how do we live our love story the way our parents lived them to have our happily ever after? Now this is where the practical steps come in, okay? <laughs> um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you five steps. If you guys are taking notes, please take the notes. And um, if you have any questions, please write them down and I'll answer them afterwards, okay? And these steps are going to be um, trying to come to the, um, the root of the problem. Prevention is better than cure. For example, when each one of you go to your doctor, he'll say to you, in order to stop you having a heart disease or cancer, then you should just not smoke in the first place, or you should run a little bit more, or you should eat properly, or you should do this, and he'll give you preventative me measures, right? And they're so much more impactful and so much more useful than say, for example, if someone um, just said to you, um, okay, you have stage this um, disease and we're gonna have to give you this therapy for it. It's so much easier to just not go through that in the first place, right? So that's why I'm gonna try and give you preventative measures. Now, as Muslims, some people will say how we get to know someone to get married is a little bit extreme. <laughs> but then again, I, I have to use that word very carefully <laughs> because it's thrown out a lot. But even in the aspect of getting married, they think, hang on, you're in a modern society, so you're going to do this and you're going to do you're gonna do that, and you expect that that's going to actually happen. But I'm telling you from experience, and she's going to tell you a little bit about her story, that it does work. It really does work. And it's not so ludicrous if you think about it. And if we stand for what we believe in, people will respect you for that. And if you stand for saying, my religion teaches me to do this, then you should never be ashamed of it. In fact, you should be proud of that. The only thing you should be proud of is the truth, right? Nothing else. <laughs> and um, so prevention is better than cure. Now, the first step, you have to ask yourself a question. And this question is such a simple question. And the question is, is it my time to get married, right? Most people, you'll meet them and they'll say, I want to get married, I want to get married. But you don't ask yourself, is it, am I ready to get married, right? Because most of the time, I don't know if you have traditional parents, and then they'll say to you, okay, you're 15 years old, we're going to look for someone for you. <laughs> do you have that sometimes? <laughs> All right, you do. And they'll say, it's going to be a handsome man from back home. <laughs> right? And um, sometimes that's not the best thing, right? I'm going to be honest with you. But there's actually five stages and five, you could say, conditions to finding out if it is the right time for you to get married, okay? The first thing is if it's a, a I'm going to give you A, B, C, D, E, okay? Um, and the first one is compulsory. And it's compulsory upon a person to get married. You'll find out which stage you are at, hopefully, God willing. So try and think um, personally and relatively. Um, and it's compulsory for a person to get married when they themselves cannot control themselves from doing wrong, like um, fornication, or they can't control their desires. So it's best for them just to get married. Does, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Right? Uh, rather than doing it the wrong way, we tell them to do it the right way. Um, now, a great scholar of Islam, his name is Ibn Taymiyyah, may Allah be pleased with him, amazing poet, amazing scholar, his knowledge was extremely powerful. And he actually said something. He said, if a man has a strong desire to get married and he fears that if he does not marry, he will be tempted to commit fornication, then he should make it a priority over Hajj. Oh. Think about that for a second. What are the five pillars of Islam? Hajj is one of them. And if he can't control his desires, that's above him going to Hajj. That's how serious it is. And he also says, um, the ruling is also applied upon the woman, not just the man. In Islam, a woman and a man are equal, but they have different, um, different roles, so to speak, according to, say, you could say our biological um, positions, like a man, for example, cannot hold a baby in his stomach for nine months, right? And um, so a woman has different um, emotions, hormones, etc. We're not here to talk about women's rights, but you guys understand, right? Um, however, when it comes to piety and it comes to loving God and believing in God, a woman and a man are the same exactly. In God's eyes, they're exactly the same. And um, 
And it says that if a woman is going through this and she feels that she's also going to be committing fornication, she can't control her desires, then she should get married too. That's what the scholar said. And that's the first part. So number one, it's compulsory for you to get married if you can't control yourself, okay? Number two is when it's commendable for you to get married. Now this word basically means if a person is able to get married, then they should get their married. They should get married to fulfill their desires and their needs, okay? And the third thing is it's forbidden for a person to get married if the man knows he's going to hurt his wife. If he knows he has problems and he's going to abuse his wife or he's going to do something wrong. And the same for the woman. And it's actually forbidden for a man to marry a woman if he's, if he's going to do that. Isn't that powerful? Like most of the time people will say, okay, you should get married because you should get married. Maybe that will solve all of your problems. But it's actually forbidden for a person to get married if they're going to hurt the other party. Because we have to think about all areas, because they're gonna obviously it's gonna end up in divorce or something worse. And um, the fourth thing is, it's not desirable for a man or a, or a woman to get married if they think they might hurt that person, if it's likely that they will. Okay. And finally, it's allowed for a person to get married if they can control themselves, they have a desire for it, they can get married. And the difference between this and it being commendable, which is number two, is the intention. Okay, so just to review, A, compulsory, B, what was it? Commendable. Commendable. C? Not forbidden. Yes, D? Excellent. D? Not desired. Not desired. And E? Intention. Exactly, beautiful. Uh, allowed, actually. Mm, <laughs> allowed. <laughs> Tricked you. <laughs> allowed. But you were going to say it, right? I'm sure you felt it and thought it. Um, okay, so that's step one. Is it the right time for you to get married? Now, if you guys are reflecting over these, these steps, then you guys probably know what stage you are at, so you don't have to tell me right now. But you guys just know it for yourselves. And um, the step two is to choose the right person to get married to. And this day and age, it's actually very hard to decide who to get married to. A guy will come to you and he'll be so handsome and he'll be able to support you and he seems to tick every box, but then how do you know he's the right person, right? So I'm gonna try and give you a little bit of, um, a bit of clarity, hopefully, God willing. And um, the, a very important thing to do is choose the correct spouse. And why is this so important? Why is this so important that you don't just choose who your parents bring for you when you're 15 years old and say, okay, I choose you because my mom told me to. There's other things that you have to look at, which is so important. Why is it important? Obvious answer. Yes. Like compatibility. If you guys don't get along, it's going to lead to divorce. Exactly. Exactly. Yes. Oh, children too. Yeah. Children. Like who they follow. And exactly. Like a role model. And stuff. Exactly. And sister, you had your hand up? Yeah. Uh, He's going to complete your dream, your religion. Yes. And he's going to be a companion and partner. Exactly. On his journey in life. So if he's not going to support you mm -hmm. and make you a better person, mm -hmm. then you're going to lose it. So you need somebody who's going to make you a better person and bring the best out of you. Yes, exactly. Beautiful. All of you are correct. You know why it's so important. And um, what is a good spouse? That's the next question, right? Um, now, for a man, we already know. Because the men, there's always talks going on saying a man should look for this, a man should look for that. I'll just tell you what a man should look for briefly, and then I'll tell you what a woman should look for, okay? So uh, just, just wait one second. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the thing which a man should look for is in Islam, the reason to choose a wife differs. Uh, from property, status, beauty, and religion. So a man could marry a wife based on all of them four things, but the Prophet, peace be upon him, said, choose the woman with religion. Choose the woman with religion. He, but you can choose them for other reasons, but religion is the one that is for sure going to last. Definitely. Uh, God willing. And we always say God willing because we don't always know the future. We can't predict the future, but we can do what we can to try and make it right. And um, the thing with um, a woman, when she looks for a man, because I was actually confused about this myself, and I had to ask my teacher. I said, well, you've told me what a man is supposed to look for. What is a woman supposed to look for? And what do you think, what do you think a woman should look for in a spouse? Mm -hmm. Sorry? Religion. Religion. Very good. Anything else? Yes. Uh, merciful and uh, not greedy. Agree. <laughs> That's yeah, actually, very good. Don't marry a man who's greedy. Yes. Not, yeah. Exactly. So, 
Sorry, yes, a nice person, exactly. Very good. Yes. Manners. Manners, Manners. that's the word I was looking for. Mm -hmm. A man who is well-mannered and a man who is religion, for his religion. And then if he, has, if he has religion within him, then he fears God. So when he does wrong, to, when, when he doesn't feel the love for you so much anymore, maybe 10 years down the line and you're, you're, you're telling him, I ain't cooking for you today, or <laughs> you know, you're having a fight with him, and he'll be like, well, I've got to be merciful. I fear God. I can't wrong this woman. Mm -hmm. And then when the love, and then because he's so merciful with you and you're being respected, you'll fall back in love with him. And then the mercy will come and then the love will come. It's like a cycle. So it's so important to marry a man who has good manners and a man of religion. That's so important. Um, and when a spouse is chose based on piety is for the, and for the intention of pleasing God, uh, we find that the problem of culture, the problem of status, the problem of racism, the problem of nationalism, it goes. Because the solution of Islam has come. And people, they, I think they, they underestimate and downgrade, downgrade the power of of faith in God because when you have that faith in God your relationship guaranteed is going to be much more different than a person who has no faith in God because we have we have certain criteria and God actually made a promise he gave a word we believe as Muslims that if a man and a woman are fighting with each other husband and wife and if both of them parties want to make up then God will make them up that's a promise upon him as long as both of them want to make it up you will make up and um, a term Muslims use also is marriage fulfills half the religion. So it's important to also realize that when, when you get married, you, you, you get married to become a better person within yourself. And if you get married based on thinking, okay, um, I'm just going to get married because I feel like getting married or, you know, etc., etc. But then when you get married for the right reason, the whole game changes. Your whole life, what is our purpose in life? to serve God. And Islam literally aligns with the natural state of humanity to submit to the will of God. The fact, the very fact, in fact, there was a famous saying saying that um, there's um, by Imam al nawi and he said that the way that humans differ from animals, and let me tell you about animals a little bit. For example, the bald-headed eagle is able to see the distance of four football pitches, the fine print of newspaper, the, the, the eyesight from human sight. Think about that for a second. And then there's the, uh, the flea. It can jump the distance that a person would jump above the empire building. The ant, how much it can carry on its back compared to someone like us, right? I don't, I don't know exactly how much, but I do know it's a lot. It's more than its body weight. How much? Ten times. Ten times its body weight, right? And these animals, they have such powerful attributes to them, and then we think that we're the most great. We are intelligent, but what differs us in our bodily functions is the fact that we are able to prostrate to God with our head to the floor in a way that no animal is able to do. And that is how we, that is not the only way we're greater than animals, there's many, many other ways, but this is one of them, right? And what aspect did make us greater than anything else? The aspect of worship to God. Our legs, they bend right for a reason yeah they help us walk but there's a bigger picture you know there's a bigger purpose in our lives we're here for a reason we're here for a purpose absolutely nothing is purposeless and when we get married we marry for a reason a purpose we marry to to fulfill half of our religion and um the thing is when people do meet their spouses they become better people but now let's move on to step three okay i'm not going to bore you for too long step one is what <coughs> is, is it time? time is it the time? Has the time come? <laughs> and um, step two is choosing the right right person. Right. Exactly. Excellent. And step three is doing things properly. Doing things properly. Now, many times people will begin their relationship and they'll see these um, commercialized things. I don't mean to store out any names, but I'm going to do it anyway. Um, Twilight, right? <laughs> the official romantic movie, right? And then you see so many other things. Just recently, you've seen Fifty Shades of Grey. The big oh high no, I did not see that. I did not. Well, you see it? <laughs> no. <laughs> Why are you no, 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 no,
you might not have seen it, but uh, a lot of people about did it. see it though, exactly. right? Yeah. Mm. And the thing is, it has this messed up understanding of a romance, blood. right? Emotional, blackmail, abuse, whatever, right? She's a virgin. What? In the movie. <laughs> I'm just saying. It's crazy, but at the same time, people think that this is love, right? Mm -hmm. But it's, it's not love. It's not love at all. And um, the thing is, you have to we have to try and do things properly. That's the most important thing. And in Islam, it's understood that true love. She's gonna expand on this a bit more. But true love is through the love of God, and everything else is gonna fit into its perfect place. And this means yes, you do get to know the person, but it's done in a specific way, a specific manner, a way that is gonna last, and you're gonna have respect. For example, if if a guy really respects you, he's gonna go to your parents and ask for your hand in marriage, right? And he'll go, and when, when you get to know each other, you have a third party present. And um, that way, nothing, nothing possible is going to, the impossibility, the possibility of anything maybe happening is cut off from the root. <laughs> and um, so the most important thing is to realize that do things the right way. And a good start is a good end most of the time. Not all the time because compatibility does come in, but most of the time a good beginning is a good end. And that's that's what I wanted to really, really focus on. And the step four, step three is doing things the right way according to the Quran and authentic sunnah. And step four is when the spouse is chosen, then the marriage will take place, right? Now I want to give you guys a little story, right? Not a long story, just a quick short one. But what happened was, um, a few years ago in England, um, there was this famous, famous, famous marriage that happened. In fact, billion, millions were spent on this marriage. And this family was extremely, extremely, extremely rich. And the, the bride, she comes down in a private jet. They, they drive it, oh yeah, trust me, it was the whole palaver, everything and anything. Like, they spent money, they had money. And two weeks later, they got a divorce. <laughs> right. And people have this thing, my dream wedding day. I'm gonna have the biggest thing, I'm gonna have the best best clothes. Good, you should have good clothes, obviously. But people make such a thing that this is gonna be the one day of my life, but then they forget every other day of their life. Mm -hmm. And the thing which Muhammad, peace be upon him, said is have a simple wedding, because that's gonna be a more blessed wedding. Mm -hmm. And um, it's realistic too, and let's be honest, when you have a huge, huge wedding, hundreds of thousands of people come to your wedding, and most of them you don't even know who they are, right? You don't even know if they like you. And you're doing all of this show for people who you'll probably never see again, probably don't even like you, and you probably don't even like them. I think a wedding is a very intimate thing. I think it should be between those who you care about and those who are special to you as well. But then again, you have family members, you invite them. What I'm trying to say is not have just like a five people around a thing. No. I'm you. <laughs> I mean, you can do that. There's not, it's, that's absolutely fine. But we're just saying don't be too extravagant because a simple wedding is very blessed at the same time. Um, and finally, um, step five is after all of this has happened, you have decided step yes. Four step four. Step four. So we're, we're on step five, but I'm going to go through each of them quickly now, okay? Briefly. So step one is. Is it the right time for you? If it's yes, then you go into step two. You choose the right person. If that is the right person, yes, then you go into step three. What is step three? Doing, Doing things, things properly. properly. Doing it the right way. Making sure that when you talk to them, it's done according to the Quran and Sunnah. And I bet you anything, when you do that the right way, is there's going to be so much blessings in what you do. I know so many people who've waited for so long, and when it happens, it's like, oh my gosh. It is literally a fairy tale wedding, and it's not just for this life, it's for the after. That's why I said it's happily ever after, not happily ever now, right? Because <laughs> that's never going to happen. Yes. I actually had a question about doing things properly, because yes. I know there's a lot of questions behind of that. Mm -hmm. And um, I know I was speaking to someone, and they were telling me how, um, you know, you always have to have a third party um, there, but mm -hmm. I always wondered, like, if if it were in a public area, if mm -hmm. if you would still need that third party, because I've mm -hmm. never, I, I've never been comfortable with uh, third party. Yeah, that. But also, <laughs> like, in a public area, I know myself, I would never do anything, mm -hmm. and I understand, like, that person of is course. not me. Of course. But uh, 
that, yeah, um, that was my question. <laughs> that's a good, that's a very good question. My sister's going to answer that in the Q&A session, inshallah, okay? Okay. So <laughs> just, just keep, how all that thought, she's going to answer that. Sure. Um, so, so basically, um, just to, just to rewind a little bit, uh, but step three is doing things properly. We're going to answer the questions, uh, God willing, after, okay? Okay. So please just. A little bit, a little bit more minutes, <laughs> a little bit more time. And step four is when you, yes, you've done things properly, and the person is chosen, and you're like, yep, that's the one. Then you'll just say, okay, time to get married, and do everything simply, do everything rightfully, and um, try to um, limit the kind of like sometimes in a wedding they'll be like they'll be doing so many crazy things like dancing, you know, everyone to their own, right? But just try and. Do it as according to the pure, pure form of the religion as possible. And um, a good start, like we said, is a good end. Now, finally, the step five is when everything is going ahead, cling onto the most, the most trustworthy handhold. Who knows what that is? Like the, the handle to Allah. That is the handle to Allah. That's very, that's very beautiful. And um, that is, um, that is definitely a handhold, but the one that I'm talking about is something else. What is it, Maria? The trustworthy handhold, the rope of Allah, which is a good arm, right? Yeah, that's yeah. That's there's, difference. there's difference of opinions, but m as scholars have said that is the Quran. But also, it could be la uh, ilaha illallah. But the point is, the Quran is the word of God, and if we abide by the Quran through any problem that you go through, and we're not saying that, by the way, when you get married, everything is going to be hunky dory or it's going to be perfect. We're just saying that at least you're going to know how to deal with your problems. Right? Because everyone has problems, nothing is, nothing is perfect. And, um, and you don't go through the mentality of also thinking that when you, when you meet someone, you think, okay, this is my salvation. This is my, he's gonna, he's gonna be everything that I needed to make me a whole woman. So if you go through that mentality, which goes back to, is it the time to get married? Back to number one, is always reassess your intention. Why do you want to get married? And like we said, if it's just because you think that he's going to help you in your, if he's going he's gonna to be everything for you and anything for you, then that's probably not a good idea for you to get married. Because once you see um, the infatuation stage go off and you get to see him for who he really is, you're going to be disappointed and you're going to be regretful and you're going to be remorseful for, for, for jumping to something. Because there's only one who can really ever fill that hole within you and she's going to expand on that a little bit more. And who is that? The only he who can really make you whole. Who? Allah, your creator. And the man is just to help you get closer to your creator. Because he's not he's going through his own issues too. And so are you. And also just one last thing before I finish. We went through everything. Um, marriage is once you get married, it's not gonna be a happily ever after. That's gonna be the beginning of your happily ever after. Meaning that you've got to work for it. And it's not gonna be easy, but it's gonna be worth it. Definitely. And um, I hope that hopefully answered a few of your questions. Uh, we're going to answer most of your questions afterwards, God willing. And with that, I will close. Well, that's in an insane and a few minutes. In the Latin, I'm going to ask all you how to work for us. Okay, so now it's my section of the Quran. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to focus on two types of love and the first one I'm going to talk about is to do with relationships and I'm going to talk more from my experiences because I feel like a lot of you might be able to relate because I'm going to take you back around five years into my mindset and what was going on at that time and um, alhamdulillah I'm married now, I've been married for a year and um, a year and a half alhamdulillah and so I'm going to give you some of my advices and then the second part inshallah what I'm going to do is talk a little bit more about the actual love that you should die for which is the title of the lecture so inshallah I hope that you can benefit um, so taking it all back around five years my mindset was completely different I was going into college and I was thinking I really don't want to get married. That was basically my mindset. I was fine, Hamza, like I could, you know, I'd say I could control myself around people. I wasn't like, you know, um, Hamza. And so I always thought, oh, marriage, after I graduate, after I do this, after I do that, when I become established, a man just seems like um, an obstacle in my goals for life. And, you know, I never really thought of marriage in that way. My intention was never really there for marriage, you know, and so, I never really took anything seriously if a proposal came, but it just so happened that none of the proposals fitted what I wanted anyway. 
And so when I was in the college environment, you know, I went to um, St. Francis College when we moved from the UK. And there were a series of events that happened, and then eventually I ended up getting married to who is my husband now, Hansla. And when I was in school, a lot of the people who were approaching me, I noticed were not Muslim. And it was really weird for me because I was thinking to myself, wow, okay, maybe it's because it's New York and people have a different way or more open way of thinking and they think that even if you wear a hijab on your head or even, you know, the fact that you say that you're Muslim, they still don't regard that as like, um, you know, a caution sort of sign. They still felt like there was no barrier in coming to talk to you. And so once I would come into my class and I saw like, I guess you could say a note on the table and it had a love heart on it. So, <laughs> and so I opened up the note and it would have like a different comment on it every single day. And it would say something, one day it was, you have a really beautiful smile. <laughs> and I would literally look around and be like, you know, who wrote this note? And everyone would just be looking at their book, so I had absolutely no idea. And then I kept coming in and every time I kept seeing this note on, you know, the table. And then I was just, you know, I was baffled, just put it to the side, continued with my work. And then one day I was in the library and a guy came up to me, he wasn't Muslim, and he said to me, oh, I'm the one who leaves notes on your table. <laughs> I'm the one who leaves notes on your table, you know, and I just wanted to introduce myself. And so I thought, okay, clearly I know what the intentions are from the beginning, but, you know, he, he still feels that he can come and talk to me. And for me, that's very, I wasn't used to that. And I just felt like, I just kept brushing it off, you know, okay, okay, bye, class. <laughs> you know and then eventually it got to a point where he came over and then he said um, you know I want to talk about Islam and I want to become a Muslim and at that stage it was almost like okay and then he said and I want to marry you and I honestly he didn't know me at all hardly like he just knew me from what he saw in you know in classes and you know very little about me so for him to say something like that it was kind of like a big shock and I became in a sort of dilemma should I even talk to him about Islam because Islam is a good thing and we should preach and we should do that well but at the same time it's wrong the way that it would be happening because there needs to be a third person there because we know that when any two people are talking of opposite gender the third is shaitan and so I got into like this dilemma where, you know, what, what shall I do, you know, and at the same time there was another brother who had proposed to me and oh I wasn't sure, but you know, I no, it was a very unusual sort of um, stage in my life when I was... Um, but I mean, I think it was a learning curve and I learned a lot through that experience and I think it's what led me to realize that, you know, what I did want in a marriage, what I did want in a partner. So when the right one came, I knew, okay, this is the one for me. And what happened was I, you know, was in that dilemma and then, you know, I decided actually after talking to a lot of people about it, you know, opinions from scholars, that this wasn't, it wasn't right for me to even preach to him. And most of the time when people come to you in that way, you should be very careful because if Shaitan can't get you with something that is directly or evidently wrong, then he's going to get you through something that you think is good, but he'll associate with something evil. And, um, you know, I completely shut it down and then he, you know, he was very upset and then, but alhamdulillah, you know, the situation was cleared up. It was like almost, oh, that alleviated me from that. And it was kind of like a test, I think, you know, and I know that this happens because if that is happening to me in a school environment, then I'm positive that it's probably happening to a lot of sisters who are out there, despite whether you wear hijab or not, I'm positive that some people actually feel that they can still come up to you and that's something that you're going to have to deal with or, you know, be accustomed to because sometimes people don't understand what the hijab means. They just think it's a symbol of your faith but they don't realize that it should be a protection <coughs> from that. And so the, uh, the way of you protecting yourself is to know your limits. And so once that happened, um, you know, many months passed and um, as a spoken word poet, I do poetry at a lot of events, you know, sometimes in different cities and I performed in Philadelphia and um, 
you know, I didn't really get to mix in very, very much with any of the people because I was basically there. It took me two hours to get there, 45 minutes perform, and then two hours back to New York. So I was very rushed because I didn't want to be home late. But I remember um, one brother did come up to me and he said to me, he didn't even say salam or anything. He just said, do you have Twitter? And I was like, okay, <laughs> this is really weird. Yes, I have Twitter. <laughs> and then um, and that was it and he just walked away. And he must have added me or followed me or something. And actually that was my husband to oh my who God. I'm married to now. And he actually messaged me in a big long email and I had never been exposed to this before. I'm always used to people always saying something like, can I get your number? Or shall we get to know each other a little bit more? Or they'll come under the pretense of, I want to convert to Islam or, you know, something like that. And um, when he said that to me, I decided, I actually didn't even respond to him at first. I talked to my sister about it and she said to me, are you crazy? You go and say no to him and he's the only person who's ever asked you in the right way and so thanks for thinking about it you know we did pursue a conversation um, you know with my brother tagged so it was always a third person but it wasn't as if my brother's like checking every single sentence it was just it would just be it would just be like oh I received an email I know that they're notifying me or I'm involved so I trust that they're not saying anything wrong and maybe occasionally I might check up you know and alhamdulillah you know after about six to eight months, you know, we decided that it was time for us to get married and then alhamdulillah we went through and got married. Um, and our marriage, I wouldn't say is conventional, but it is becoming conventional now because what we did is we did the nikah much earlier than we had the walima. And it was only because I hadn't graduated and, um, you know, I was actually still living in my, uh, well, with my family before having even moved in with my husband. And so, you know, I feel like I wouldn't recommend that for a lot of people because when you're communicating through text, it can cause a lot of miscommunication. And that's going to be your main source of communication if you're not living with someone. Well, for me, it is. Some people are, you know, phone people, you know, whatever it is. And so, you know, that's my advice for you. I personally believe that that obstacles will come to you. And once you surpass those obstacles, maybe Allah will bless you with the right person because you, you succeeded over those kind of obstacles. And that's how I felt you know, that's what I felt happened with me. And so that's the relationship part of um, the lecture. And if you guys have questions, then, you know, inshallah, after I finish the second part, then feel free to ask us both and we'll just give you, you know, our advice and nasiha. So the second part of my lecture, now I want to talk to you about a very different type of love. This is the love to die for. So I'm going to tell you about a story very different to the one that my sister told you, which is about Adam and Hawa. That was a love story. This is different. This is a story about a king and a queen, and they're both mentioned in the Quran. And what's interesting about their relationship is that the king, by name, we know that he is promised hell, and the queen is promised paradise. And it makes you think very, you know, deeply about their relationship. How can two people that came together, one goes to hell and one goes to paradise? But when you learn about the story and you actually reflect about it, I would highly recommend that for you. It's in Surah Al-Qasas. Um, Al you can read the story. And basically, it's the story of Fir'aun and Asya. Mm -hmm. Peace be upon them. Peace be upon Asya. And what we're told about the story is with the story of Musa alayhi salam, his mother was commanded to basically um, put him into the river when she felt danger would come to her. So she put the infant into the river and he, you know, obviously moved along with the river and, and he was received by the household of Fir'aun. And when he was received, obviously the law at that time by Pharaoh was that he would kill all infant males and he would leave the infant females. And that was his way of persecuting the, the Israelites at the time. And so when they saw the young boy, they were about to kill him. And it was Asiya who said to him, and it is noted in the Quran, I'll read to you the, um, the, the verse. This is verse 9 of Surah Al-Qasas, if you, if you guys are making notes. And the wife of Pharaoh said, A comfort of the eye for me and for you. Kill him not. Perhaps he may be of benefit to us, or we may adopt him as a son. And they perceived not the result of that. And so, if we go back a step, and we look at the story of um, Musa's mother, Ummi Musa. When she was told to put her son 
um, or to give up her son in that way, you think to yourself, well, pause for a second, the greatest love amongst creation, natural, unconditional love, is the love that a mother has for a child. Meaning the child is born and has done absolutely nothing for the mother in terms of favours, but it's that natural mercy that is put between their hearts. And then she's told to sacrifice that for the love of God, or because of the command of God. So we see how her love for God surpassed any love that she had for even her own child. And we see the, the belief, and Allah says in the Quran, verse 10, And the heart of the mother of Moses became empty for every thought except the thought of Moses. She was very near to disclose the case, basically that she was near to telling them that that was her, her son. Had we not strengthened her heart with faith so that she might remain as one of the believers? Why is this such a powerful verse? Because again, we see how Allah strengthened her heart to believe. And because of that, she didn't go against the command of God and she accepted it. And as a mercy, he was brought back to her. We know the story that Musa alayhi salam's sister was watching from a place that they couldn't see. And then she suggested, and it just happened to be that he wouldn't um, feed, um, he wouldn't um, suckle off any of the other females. And basically it was recommended that he would go to the family of, of course, his mother. And then he was there with her again and it was a coolness to her eyes. So going back to that, um, the story of Asiya and Fir'aun. Now, a lot of people don't know, but actually Asiya accepted Islam. And it was when Musa came back to Egypt that he began preaching Tawheed to the people. Tawheed being the oneness in God. And this is essentially the message that every single prophet and messenger came with. So all they would reiterate, well, the main point that they would reiterate is the oneness in God. And of course, we know that different messengers um, had different sharia but basically the concept is one god and none but he and as we know pharaoh at the time was saying i am god worship me that's how arrogant and tyrannical he was and he would kill and torture anyone who said that he was not god and who worshiped the god of moses so basically the story was that she accepted islam and she was um believing under the guidance of musa alayhi salam and Pharaoh had no knowledge of this up until a certain point. And actually, we're told that she was very, she was very devoted wife, meaning she was, you know, extremely devoted to her husband. But when she came to Islam and she actually started seeing how he was torturing the Muslims, it didn't sit right with her, and she developed a hatred for him. And because of that, naturally, she became distant. And actually, according to Ibn Abbas, when she um, she was trying to escape the tyranny of Fir'aun when he actually found out she was Muslim. It was uh, revealed to him that she was Muslim and she ran away trying to seek guidance from Allah and he found her and he brought her back and he tortured her for three days. And what the way in which he tortured her, subhanAllah, you can't even imagine like that kind of punishment that husband would do to his wife when you expect mercy in that kind of relationship. So what happened to her um, actually, rewind a couple of steps. Before he did the torture, he actually tempted her. He said, I'm going to give you anything you want in terms of luxury. He proposed to her everything she could have imagined. Imagine the pharaoh of Egypt. He had everything that you could imagine in terms of material wealth. He could have given her anything she wanted, and she was a queen. And she actually demoted herself from that status as queen and escaped because of her love for God. And when he was torturing her, she actually said to him, I reject you and I do not want anything to do with you whilst he's torturing her. And by now, Pharaoh knew that how strong her faith was. He became so angered and so enraged. What he did was um, he put a rock, a boulder on top of her and he had his men nail her body to the floor and he would leave her out into the sun and it was I believe for three days and he just left her there to die in the heat of Egypt, Egyptian sun. I'm sure you can imagine African heat. And um, in her last moments, um, we, famously she's known for saying to Allah, my Lord build for me a home with you in paradise and deliver me from Pharaoh and his work, and deliver me from the unjust people. So why am I telling you the story? And she died. Um, and we know that, that her dua is accepted. This is what we're told. 
And why am I telling you this story? Because we know the relationship, the context of her, you know, her marriage. She was married to a king, but her love for the king was not the objective. The man was not her objective. He was only a means. And if that meant that her, the man that she married would be persecuting her, but her means, but he was a means for her to enter into Jannah, then her, her objective was still fulfilled. Because her objective was not to get the man and to keep the man. It was, to, to, it was for Allah. Basically, the objective is to please Allah. And if a man is the means to do that, then that will happen and facilitate it. So this is why I'm telling you the story of Asiya, um, peace be upon her. And we know many of the um, the females who are mentioned in the Quran, Maryam, peace be upon her. The story of Maryam and what she went through, these were women who reached the level of excellence. We know this. And so this is um, who we should be looking up to. And there's nothing wrong with wanting to get married for, you know, because you're attracted to someone, you want someone to support you, you want someone to, uh, to help you in your religion. All of these things should be there because this, is, this should be the reason that you want to get married. Someone who has good deen, but they should be there to facilitate your, you pleasing your Lord. And if they're not doing that and you know this before marriage, that their obstacle is not the same as yours, then you should question the person that you're about to marry. And um, for me, that was definitely one of the main things that I was looking for because when I was talking to my husband, you know, and this is another, you know, topic in itself. What, what do you talk about when you're talking to someone who you want to get married? Because a lot of people come up with like a list of questions and I do encourage that. But at the same time, what I always say to sisters is you have to be a bit smarter than that. You have to be two steps ahead because guys always know you're going to ask certain questions. So what you should do is have a conversation with him, of course, with the right people there in the presence of the conversation but what you should do is talk to him ask him questions about his life because what you do with that is you get to know a lot more because when you're asking questions directed to marriage he's going to have a barrier up and already well versed answers so to avoid that what you're doing is he's lifting his well he's putting his barriers down and then you're actually getting to know what he's about just through general conversation so that's what um, I would encourage you to do and I guess we can open it now to just questions and answers